Okay, so today we're going to discuss governance and borders. And um, one of the things that I want to discuss, to, just to introduce Benjamin's lecture. So Benjamin is a postdoc. He's a postdoc with us. He's doing something in law, which is, I think, very complex. He's writing a book with us on multiple forms of governance around states. So it's, it has to do with both intergovernmental relations within states, trans, uh, in, so intergovernmental relations, international relations, so within, between states, and then what is going on. Um, in, he has a specific case study where he looks at what's going on in the European Union, and then what we call transnational relations, which is beyond states and international relations, something much more complex that obviously superimposes itself onto uh, the governance of states. And so when we look at borders, especially when we look at mechanisms of border governance, it's quite interesting to, to study these different things, especially if we're interested in mobility and flows, trade mobility and flows. But just generally speaking about regulatory systems, whether they are regulatory systems that apply within the bounded uh, boundaries of the state, right, the bounded state, or across international boundaries, or beyond states' boundaries, um, when they are regulatory systems that apply and sometimes even constrain a multitude of states and other types of organization across borders. So, so this is kind of what we're looking at today. And one of the things that I want to do very, very briefly, the first five, six minutes, is basically to set this debate in perspective before Benjamin goes in. This is what we agreed I would do. And we actually have a podcast available, but in French only. So I'm going to use the content of the podcast if you want to, you can listen to it. It's actually on our website, so but it's in French. I'll do I'll do the exact same in English um, when I have time. Once I'm done with the partnership proposal, which um, is due Friday, so I have three more days of high stress, and then things will get much better. Nicole and I will have submitted two shirt brands this week, and she's defended her PhD proposal successfully. So. Thanks to the team, I have to say, we're able to do all of this, which is wonderful. So one of the things that I think is really interested, I interesting about governance of borders and what we've learned in the literature over the last 20, f uh, 20 or so years is that it's basically becoming more and more complex, but it's also that we have to understand the evolution in a way of the history of ideas here, that the, pro the progressive evolution over the last 20 years of the thinking about governance of borders, right? And I think there is an evolution in basically the very nature of the governance. So when we talk about governance, obviously very often we talk about, you know, at least the action of more than one government. So governance at the very beginning would suggest that we have more than one government in action. But it can also be sometimes understood, and I'm trying to define here governance, as basically the interaction between one government office, a government department, for instance, with a number of stakeholders. And what we're looking at here specifically is basically that measuring and understanding this relationship that a government or a government department would have with these different stakeholders. Traditionally, when we talked about borders, very often the stakeholders were inside the government, right? Until, until the 1950s, uh, 60s, even, even uh, you know, uh, late 60s, uh, even in Europe, they were very limited relations about the border policy between two states. And so very often when we talk about governance, it's actually what the state is doing about its own borders. Um, and I think it's interesting because it starts with the idea of the boundary line. So we have a boundary line and we basically have po policies that basically all go all the way to the end of the, the boundary line. People who study regulatory system, they call this the sandbox. Because you know how a sandbox is basically bordered with boards, 
and you put kids inside and they can play with this, well, regulatory systems very often are basically bordered by the boundary, the international boundary line. And traditionally, if you look at, for instance, the European Union, it's an interesting case, right, because it's a new organization of states. And in the 1950s, the EU has no agreements outside of the EU. In the 60s, it has very, very few agreements outside of the EU. What it is doing is developing a, a regulatory system inside the sandbox. Today, it has more than 3,000 with the rest of the world. And just with African states and the Mediterranean region, it's like 2,500. So what we're studying today and discussing is understanding these progressive transformation of the governance of borders thanks to these transformation of regulatory systems which are you know legal tools but if you know we should really be aware of the fact that regulatory systems have always been with states but again limited to the boundary of the sandbox the border the frontier the, the boundary line and so the limits of the territory for the longest time limited the extent to which a legal system or regula regulations and rules applied um, outside of the state. And so when we look at the governance, obviously one of the things that is really interesting is that the actors involved are really limited to within the state actors. They don't even get, it's not, it's even that the, the type of actors remain state bound you know it's it's they are th they are basically policy tools of the states it's the army to a certain extent and that's it's at war it's policing it's custom it's immigration officials and they all act and when they interact obviously they form some kind of state governance but they all act within the states at the boundary of the states implementing basically state functions at the limits of the sandbox Now, obviously, I think that over the last 20 years, these things have really expanded. And one of the first writers on this that really identifies some of this transformation very early, I think, is Kenichi Omae, he's a Japanese consultant, who has published a, a couple of books. And when he discusses this, he starts talking about how you know states might even disappear because we see so many in a way, transboundary agreements appearing within certain areas of business. So it's like regulatory systems that are basically perforating across um, state borders and transform this very, very deeply. But he's been criticized, and the idea of you know the borderless world that he had actually written on has been criticized, especially in the 90s, post 90s, post 9-11, obviously very seriously undermined. I still think that he had, in a way, a very interesting idea, and I'll come back on this, but he, he was early in the game, and he had very little data to actually support his claim that the world was basically going to be, you know, basically completely open. Um, but, uh, and, and I would say that, you know, in the 1990s, Early 2000, we see a very large number of authors, starting with Nancy Passy and David Newman paper, for instance, in the early 90s, that really discover that actually a border policy is very often the result of the interaction between two states' sets of policies. That the boundary line idea is just a treaty, but once you start, you're talking about policies, you very often have two sets of policies that are kind of back to back, not even talking to each other. And this is one of the things that, for instance, Tony Payon identifies in the three border wars, is that they have loopholes because they don't talk to each other. So you do have sets of policies about monitoring basically the boundary line to implement border policies, but they back to back. And they are, they are full of loopholes because they don't complement each other. A very a traditional example, which I think is really fun, it's the idea that you would have, for instance, uh, custom border guards patrol the <coughs> boundary line at the exact same time on both sides. And traffickers being aware of this because they've observed them and using the time that no boundary 
was actually being monitored to actually organize their traffics, right? And one of the first things that the IBED, the Integrated Border Enforcement Teams, did in North America under the leadership of the RCMP to start and tested in Blaine in our region first, was to actually say th to the other side, don't you want to monitor when we are not monitoring? And then if we stop anybody, we'll just let you know, which is a very basic idea. I identified the first, and I published on this, identifies the first initiative with this kind of cooperation between Canada and the US in the early 1990s. In other words, we can almost touch the history, right? Because it's not so far behind us. Um, but so early people like Antsy Passy, David uh, Newman, and then James Scott, Vladimir Kodolov, and a number of other, uh, others basically talk about the border as a public policy. And the governance of these public policies are basically an emerging field of study, um, which is an extension of the states, but are not always, um, you know, are not always just back to back. In other words, we see that this progression of partnership has evolved very, in a way, very progressively post 9-11 across many different areas of the world, but still, it remains fairly recent to us. So governance of borders then becomes a little bit more complex because we are talking about a multitude of public sector actors that are interacting with each other and working together to enforce basically a policy which I have called um, in a way parallel, right? I've called this um, policy parallelism. And the idea is that you have sets of policies that have maybe different goals. But altogether, these goals complement each other. And the great difficulty, for instance, between the policy goal of the Mexican states and the US United States states is that the northern border for Mexico and the southern border for the US are comp have completely different goals. At one point in the 90s, one of the things, one of the action of certain ministers, some ministries of the Mexican government was to help people cross the northern border with pamphlets that would explain where to go and where they would find water and path and secured way across the border, while at the same time the US had greater difficulties enforcing control <coughs> at border gates and strengthening the controls, right? So we, we really realize that the diversity of public sector actors that are involved in this form of governance sometimes is quite vast. Um, but one of the things that I think is really interesting at this point is that I would say probably in the 1990s that monitoring of the boundary line of the border region, if you want, or the border itself as a policy, the idea of Nancy Passy and David Newman, a border is a policy, um, in a way comes out of the box of the public sector. It's not just an issue for states to discuss. And that the diversity of actors influencing, in a way, the policy outcome becomes more diverse. An illustration of this is all of the non-profit civic actors that are involved, um, environmental groups, but also you know, human, human uh, right groups, um, but also much more. Um, much more, um, um, in a way, aggressive and policing groups that are made of, um, you know, vigils, for instance, in, in s on certain borders that so private individuals or, or groups and civic or groups that are basically monitoring on, sometimes only on their own behalf, but are involved in basically the construct of the governance of the policy. Um, and it's quite interesting to see that, especially on the, on the Mexico-US border, that here again, on the one side, you have very different groups that are involved. You obviously, you have the states, you have, you know, and I mean states um, as government of states, you have federal government actors. Uh, Sometimes in certain regions, you have health officials, you have, you know, people who have to do with real human rights organizations, people who deal with refugees. You also have traffickers, you have criminal organizations. And the same, but sometimes, and I, I mean, you know, if you do, you do um, a case study analysis, you find that the, that diversity, that tapestry of different groups varies quite a bit. Um, with, um, for instance, if you look at uh, at the uh, 
US-Canada case or if you look at other uh, places around the world. But the point I'm trying to make here is that the diversity of the governance becomes the number one issue with good governance of um, the boundary line. So um, the, that's kind of the introduction that I, I can um, basically give. It's that this tapestry, right, the way we look at this governance and the, the complex group of actors that actually together compete with each other, compete with state actors to implement what becomes the policy is a really interesting one. It illustrates just the enforcement of the boundary line, which becomes therefore a real challenge for the states because they're not the only actors. Now, I discuss specifically the boundary line now to actually introduce the work that Benjamin is going to talk to us about. What Benjamin has done, he's, he's not looking at, which I would say, at the murkiness of the case studies that I've just talked about, but it's in a way a nice prism or a nice uh, way to understand this complexity. He's looking at in a way all of the regulatory mechanisms, all, all of the legal agreements that states and non-state actors, whether from the public or private sector, have basically entered with each other into to create uh, regulatory systems, sometimes within the state, sometimes across states' uh, international boundaries, sometimes across international regions, and sometimes across the global world, so transnational agreements, uh, that basically, in the same way, challenge the authority of the bounded, the integrity of the bounded territory and sovereignty of the state. So as we see at the boundary line, a state on the defensive, what Benjamin is going to talk to us about is also in a way a multiplicity of legal transformation, of transformation of regulatory systems that really undermine the authority of the state. There are a number of reasons why, obviously, he will detail some, but I'll give you a few leads so you can start thinking about it. International, global, transnational agreements, for instance, put tremendous pressure on state resources when they have to be enforced at home, but also when international actors, such as the private sector, decide to enforce them onto a given state. And I'll remind you of two of those. Think about Chinese pressures to have the right to use water routes and who have developed now maps and guidelines for Chinese pilots, that's the way they are called, to navigate Canadian waters in the summer across the Arctic routes that we have. That is placing Canada in a very difficult situation because it means that we as a state in the international community of and you know the, 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 the basically uh, recognized obligations of states for their waters, we have to provide security standards that are international security standards to those who are navigating in the waters, which in the Arctic are extremely expensive and so there is tremendous international pressure for Canada to basically up the policy offering. Some people have argued that it means the construction of deep sea harbors in the Arctic bound border, border regions of Canada, but also investments in a, a, a number of boats and air, air and sea uh, security uh, intervention capacities that Canada doesn't have today. We have in the big program papers that have documented how expensive it would be to move, for instance, the air um, uh, capacity that right now is just north of Nanaimo and has a 72 hours intervention capacity onto the Arctic, to move it north and to multiply it by two or three. They're massive investments. So this is one. 
example that I think is a really interesting one because it shows that you know these international agreements actually do put these global transnational agreements do put pressure on states. Another one that is much more at home but was very um, interesting was you know in NAFTA how at one point um, the federal government was really afraid that the private sector start asking for a specific article of the NAFTA agreement to be in a way challenged in court so that clear water from the Great Lakes of Canada be start flowing into the United States. So it's not a discussion that has come back in the media, but a, a few years ago, before we started the work on borders and globalization, that was discussed in the media because people in the US were starting about thinking whether or not they would go after the federal government. And one of the things that I had thought was very interesting at the time was the idea that basically the Canadian government was not going to have the resources to fight that court that case in court, in international court, in court of arbitration, and would, would be very likely to, lo to lose just on the fact that it needed to defend itself. So what we see is that these transnational agreements can really change the relationship that state, a state has with its neighbor, but also change the relationship the state can have in, in you know, the transnational community. So Benjamin is going to look at this much more in detail and illustrate that transformation of the governance and how borders, looking at this from the perspective of borders, is fa fascinating. And I'll close with this. So Benjamin, go ahead. The floor Thank is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Emmanuel. <coughs> Thank you, everyone. <coughs> so let's speak about borders by the law side. And in introduction, I will speak and I will share with you some definitions about uh, what is law, what is frontier, what is postmodernity and modernity. With this hypothesis, uh, territorial boundaries are declining in different ways. My uh, first part will focus on the legal forms of postmodern governance of borders. And my second part will focus on the legal effects of um, postmodern governance of borders over the border and also over the theory of border. You could see on this slide a simple um, borders timeline, quite a very uh, short history of some ideas between the pre modern framing the modern framing and the post-modern framing, just for giving you some ideas. So what is law? Basically, we could distinguish, and some authors distinguish, three key elements. A certain social power based on an agreement of non-use of the force and an erected, uh, and the law is erected in system. That's, in a nutshell, the three key elements of what is law. <coughs> the jurisprudence uh, is full of definition of the borders and of frontiers, but this one is the famous one and is the most uh, shared uh, in the world. So it means all the states around the world <coughs> are applying this definition of the frontier. An international frontier is a line formed by the successive extremities of the area of validity in space of the norms of the, of the legal order of a particular state. That's in, in the three phrases, the legal uh, definition uh, who is applying by each state around the world. <coughs> The jurisprudence uh, taught us also the link between frontiers and territory with this short uh, phrase, to define a territory is to define its frontiers. So uh, this quotation is from the International Court of Justice in the case concerning the territorial dispute between the Libyan Arab Jamaria and the Chad in 1994. What is it behind these two definitions. 
first of all, the frontier has a line and a rigid limit with a legal protection. Second of all, the territoriality and the territorial sovereignty of state. And third, the international public law. These three points could resume what is it, the modern border, what is the paradigm of legal modernity. <coughs> what is the m this famous modernity in law? Legal modernity corresponds to the dominance of legal monism. Monism is the opposite of pluralism. What is it, legal monism? Legal monism is a theory which conceives of a state monopoly of the production of the law, or in any case, of the qualification of law. It means, in general, the state-centric thinking. That's the modernity in law. I share with you this definition, legal definition of, of governance. I, I'm, I say legal, but it's not uh, been in the definition. Uh, it's just the definition of the European Commission in 2001. And the concept of governance refers to the rules, processes, and behaviors that affect the exercise of powers at European level, particularly from the point of view of openness, participation, accountability, efficiency, and consistency. So in this introduction, we have uh, the definition of frontiers, by the jurisprudence. We have the definition of the link between the territory and the frontiers by the jurisprudence. We know what it is the modernity in law. We know also what is governance in law. <coughs> and we need to think about possibility in social science now. So in we could we could resume also the, this postmodernity because it's a huge uh, concept, it's a huge uh, movement, intellectual movement around the world, uh, and we could resume that uh, post with this phrase postmodernism introduces a critical distance from the modernist discourse that has become hegemonic. So the idea in this speech is to apply this concept of postmodernity with the border, with the governance of border, in order to know what are the effects of this postmodernity frame over the theory of border in law. What is this postmodernity in law? We could say three things about it. First of all, think differently about legal concepts and legal reality beyond the famous methodological nationalism. Second of all, we could also say, in a nutshell, that the postmodernity in law uh, uh, makes, makes, makes you think with three conceptual dimensions, the complexity, the pluralism, and the combination. That's the three main philosophical and theoretical uh, ideas with uh, with with we can think about the postmodernity in law <coughs> and the main idea of this postmodernity of course is the decentering of the state in the postmodern thought the network replaces the pyramid the legal complexity replaces legal simplicity the governance re replaces government and the regulations replace laws In the core of the speech, what is postmodern border governance? <coughs> it is the governance of the border and border problematics by other actors than the state and by other tools than those of state. State is not totally absent, but its presence is reduced and relativized. So let's now speak about the first part the postmodern governance over the border. So in this first part, I will speak about the modern, the national and international tools. And in the second part of this part one, I will focus on the postmodern local tools 
and of course the postmodern tools of the European Union. It's just a reminder in order to know what is the national uh, tools for the borders governance and the international tools for the borders governance. Of course, it, because it's the state and in, because in, it's the international public law, it's the modernity. Huh? What you could see at the screen is the modernity. So uh, in a nutshell, the national tools are including national public law, constitutional and administrative law, central administration, ministry of defense, security, customs agency, police and militaries. And in uh, the international uh, so side, you have the Treaty of Delimitation, the International Commission of Demarcation, and also, also the international neighboring law by bilateral treaties and international organization work. Neighboring law, it's, uh, it's a cooperation between states on the border regions in order to, to link the public services. But it's a link, uh, it's a cooperation between states. So it's part of the modernity also, even though it's uh, the in international cross-border cooperation. So finally, in the modern uh, framework, the border is a limit and needs to be protected and controlled because it, it's the entry inside a state territory. What about local, local tools for the postmodern borders governance? The main concept is a cross-border cooperation. From the mid-50s, a lot of local initiatives were undertaken. And today, we have 150 euro regions in continental Europe. So at the local level, you have two main, uh, two main structure, two main legal structure. Uh, some of them could be very un informal, and some of them are very formal. <coughs> So you, we could speak about e the EU region concept. EU region concept, we don't have yet uh, official definition for this term, and neither for the working community, we don't have an official definition. We could say that they could, uh, both of them share this, uh, this specificity. They are both administrative structure of cross-border cooperation between two or more territories of different European states. They don't have any political power. Their competences are lim limited. And th the first Euro region, like uh, Birte Wassenberg uh, shared with us two months ago, the first Euro region was conceived in 1958 on the border between Germany and Netherlands. And uh, about Working communities, that's very interesting, this uh, small concept of working communities. And we, f we could find these working communities in the mountains. The first, uh, the first uh, co working community appears in the Alps, uh, the second in the Central Alps, and the third in the West Western Alps. After that, we have a working community in the Pyrenees and the Jura. Both of them are infrastructure and informal and formal administrative stru structure between local entities. That's postmodern because the state is absent or plays a legal role, but before the creation, before the creation of these structures. We could call that postmodern uh, border governance at the local level. Let's move on on this bill, 500 euros, and you could notice one pictures of the uh, of the continent of Europe and some some bridges. That's the symbol of Europe, making some links between territories, territories between t states, between infrastate entities, between people. What are the European Union tools for the postmodern borders governance? So this, the concept, the main concept of at this uh, level is the European territorial cooperation. We could distinguish financial and technical tools and specific legal tools. The first financial and very important 
financial tool, sorry, is the creation of the Euro region, the European Regional Development Fund in 1975. This fund was interested by the finance of border for helping border regions projects. The second uh, financial and technical tool is Interreg. Alors, Interreg was born in 1989 and is a famous financial and technical uh, legal regime focused on the financial help and technical help for border regions and for the local cooperation. But for 10 years, 12 years now, uh, one revolution appears, one legal revolution appears with this regulation about European grouping of territorial cooperation. This new tool is very important for managing the cross-border cooperation movement between local entities. The specificity of this European grouping of territorial cooperation, it, it's, the in, it's the role of the European Union, is completely new. This, uh, this, uh, this tool, this legal tool, is completely new because it's from the European Union. Before that, it was only international or only bilateral between two countries, and only, of course, between the local entities. It's the first time you could notice a legal uh, intervention direct of the European Union in this uh, cross-border cooperation. The last tool of the European Union is just last year, it appears, is it's the regulation of the European Parliament of the Council on the mechanism to resolve legal and administrative obstacles in a cross-border context. What is it, this mechanism? It's a revolutionary in the theory of law, in the territoriality, and for the concept of territory of the state. So the main idea of this mechanism aims to simplify cross-border projects, of course, on a voluntary basis and agreed by the competent authorities in charge for the rules of one member state to apply in the neighboring member state. What it means? It means you could have a national law from one state who is able to have effects directly in the other border region of the other state with neighboring. That's completely new. It's not yet accepted because it's the process in, is in, uh, is in uh, current. So this new mechanism would apply to a specific project or action limited, li li limited in time, located within a border region and initiated by local and or regional public uh, authorities. So we could see one link between the European tool and the local uh, entities. So we could wish a dream, we could make a dream towards the border replacement by cross-border spaces in EU. And this map is full of colors and full of circumscriptions, full of lines, and all what you, what you could look is the huge amount of cross-border spaces everywhere in Europe. And we could uh, make the hypothesis of the replacement of the territorial border by this cross-border spaces. Let's move on on the part two, and let's focus on the effects of this postmodern governance over the border theory. So I will speak uh, in this part two about differentiation, about th the components of border, about uh, uh, the analysis of border in each legal order, and abo about also the relations between legal orders. What are the effects of postmodern approach over frontiers? That's the postmodern uh, theory of border. 
that 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 we build in BIG, the project Borders in Globalization project, with Emmanuel, Nicole, Michael, and other other people. So this postmodern approach of the legal frontier means four dimensions. First of all, we need to reread the modernity. We need to reread the modern frontier as a tool of differentiation. It's not a limit, it's not only separation, it's not only cooperation. It, it's better to think about the concept more, uh, more large than differentiation. And this differentiation, differentiation between states, of course, differentiation between territory, be differentiation between legal order and national public law in each territories. For me, it's the main concept. And uh, this concept could be declined in different branches. Second of all, the postmodern approach means also the, uh, to understand frontier with constitutive elements. And you will see it will be easier to understand what is what it's bo uh, what it's a border the number 3 the more the postmodern approach mean means also one analysis of the frontier through existing legal order this hypothesis we are making it, it's the border has to be understood differently between each kind of legal order. It means the border in the international public legal order, like we know, uh, is the limit, the territorial limit between states and between sovereignty, is completely different than the concept and the tool of border inside the European Union legal order. And both of them are completely different than the concept and the tool of border in the legal, uh, transnational, local, and also transnational, global order. And the last one, the last, the last dimension, we need to think about the concept of border as an interface between legal order beyond territoriality. That's the four dimensions of the postmodern border approach. I won't focus a lot about this border differentiation concept. <coughs> it's it's uh, conceptual, theor theoretical, it's uh, also philosophical, it's also a part of theory of law. Differentiation could just be a matrix concept of border, and we could distinguish in the history of border a kind of graduation, border as a simple fact, border as a legal fact, border after that as a legal act, and at the end, border as a legal tool. Let's uh, read what Hans Kelsen said about, about the territoriality of the bordering. Because the law is a law, we need to understand law. Law is a fictive thing. Huh? Law is uh, full of concepts and is full of, <laughs> of uh, abstracts. So Kelsen is the is the most important lawyer in the 20th century. He was Austrian and he became American at the end of his life. And he, he told a, a very important thing because he was a conceptual lawyer. We need to understand the concept of the border in Kelsen because Kelsen is a, is a thinker with concept, okay? He's a kind of the uh, the extension of Kant. If we want to understand Kelsen, we need to understand Kant and the philosophy of Kant. So what you, we could, we, I, could, I could read the first definition. The territory of the state is a clearly defined area. It's not a very small piece of the Earth's surface, but a three-dimensional space, which includes the subsoil underneath and the air space above the territory included in the map inside what are called the state borders. And the second is it's, it is not a knowledge of a natural sci science that can answer the question of knowing what determines the limits of the state space, what constitutes 
its unity. It is only a knowledge of legal order. We can define what is called the territory of the state only in one way. It is the domain of the territorial validity of legal state order. So, we need to understand what it means. It means the territory is just a concept, a legal concept. And it means the territory is just the domain of territorial validity of a legal state order. So with, with this lecture, we could distinguish the territory territorial <laughs> with the territory, the concept of the territory, the concept of the legal order. I could, I, we could go back after later. Friedrich, Friedrich Ratzel, a German political geographer, is the father of this discipline. He wrote that in uh, 1897. The border hem is the reality, the borderline is only the abstraction. The famous lawyer Paul de la Pradelle was inspired by uh, Ratzel theory and he, he was he is the only lawyer to have uh, to have written this kind of things because it's completely opposite than only the limit of the border enfin, the border is not a limit for for la Pradel. the delimitation the line of the bond boundary is only one aspect of the frontier before and after the delimitation the border is a zone is an area subject to a special legal, political, and economic regime, domestic law, and international law, and we could understand better what it means in the second uh, quotation. Contrary to the vocabulary usually adopted by theorists of international law, we apply the word, the word frontier exclusively to the representation of a territorial zone and contrast it with the term limit, which can only represent the line which, in practice, contemporary territorial system separates the executive powers of state. So this author is very interesting because it's the first one to try to apply this concept of border zone and not only a border limit in the theory of law and inside the theory of border. So what it means, the the theory of constitutive elements of the borders. I think we could understand better what it means border if we think border like an assemblage of different <coughs> elements. And we, it's, very, uh, it's very simple, we could understand uh, easy. We could distinguish an, et in uh, an intellectual element, sorry, with the simp simply the decision and the will from authorities and officials, we could distinguish formal element of the border, that the treaty and the official text. We could also distinguish material elements, boundary marker. And in Europe now we could distinguish a digital element of the borders because each coordinates of each lines in Europe are going inside a database after the the European Union Directive uh, of 2007. Uh, example of boundary marker, very famous uh, every well and well known around the world. <coughs> like the third element of this uh, of these effects of the postmodern governance about uh, over the theory of law. We need to, uh, like I said uh, 10 minutes ago, we need to understand borders through each legal order because it's not the same, it's not the same object. It's a matter of methodologically distinguishing the frontier and the value of the frontier through the different legal orders. There is a distinction between the national and international legal order, the European legal order, and the transnational legal order, local or global. And this picture is the Lex Mercatoria. I think it's the one of the oldest one, written by Gérard Malines, and it was a mer merchant. And we will speak a little bit about that.
So <laughs> we need to think the border between different scales, but it's not only a scale, it is also a legal order. And we think a kind of transnational local order between local entities are challenging the concept of the limit of the territorial state. And this transnational local order, like this example, is uh, the cre creation of the transboundary space in G around Geneva. So <coughs> Gene Geneva is a small, is the smallest piece of land with line with black lines, and, and around that, the yellow part is a French territory. So since uh, ten years, for ten years, a, a, a lot of political uh, and a lot of uh, and the civil society try to build this cross-border space in this region. And of course, cross-border cross -border law could help cross-border organisms, organis cross-border infrastructure, etc., etc. So this, uh, this cross-border space is well integrated. In the European Union legal order, we need to think Europe and Europe, uh, the European Union, like a big cross-border space. We are not at the at the scale of the local actors, but we need to think about the European Union like a huge cross-border space. So the effect of this European European Union legal order of, over the border. Of course, the functions of the board of the border of the classical territorial border are integrated in the legal order of the European Union. It means the border between states, between like example between France and Germany, are not anymore a limit of the cross-bordering pathway. The freedom of the, the freedom of the circulation of goods, services, and people. Are an are a, a reality in the European Union, so it means the border is still there. Okay, the limit is still there because we have the international public order, who is still there. The states are still there, but the function of the limit of the border is completely different. So it means we need to distinguish the interpretation of what is it a border in international public order and inside this European Union legal order is a completely reframing of the concept of the border. The functions of the control of borders are not anymore at the limits, but they are, they are localized at the limit of the territory of the European Union. We could speak about Europeanizations of borders. And a, uh, uh, a, big, uh, a big movement is the construction of a territorial policy like I said in the first part, with this European territorial cooperation, the European Union is becoming a big territory, homogeneous. So it means borders are completely different. And we could, we could see only post-modernized borders in European Union for the member states. Last level, last scale, but last also uh, in uh, framework of interpretation, the legal global order. At this level, in this case, in this interpretation framework, borders plays a role completely different also, because we could see a bypass, we could see this legal global order within construction. It doesn't exist yet, but a lot of uh, elements are uh, some kind of evidences of this construction of, of this apparition of this this legal global <coughs> order around the world and the first effect the first legal effect effect of the over the border and also over the theory of border is the bypassing of the territorial limit it's quite a new concept this global legal global order is quite a new uh, movement of theory, uh, notab notably the global administrative law. I will speak uh, about it uh, in the next slide. But we know very well Lex Mercatoria, because Lex Mercatoria is the 
global law of merchants around the world. The Lex Electronica is the role of this uh, foundation based in the United States for the name of each website. We could, so we could speak also about this Lex Sportiva, is the role of the International Olympic Committee and International Sports Federations, who are, who are completely independent from the states. And we know the Olympic Games, the Winter Olympic Games and the Summer Olympic Games are completely organized by this association. It's an association, it's the Swiss Association based, based in uh, Canton de Lausanne. And this association based in Switzerland organized this competition around the world and has the power, the global power, over the rules of the sports and over, the, of course, the concept of Olympic Games around the world. And you could, we could add also the rules of internet, the rules of cryptocurrencies, the blockchains. The, we could add also at this uh, uh, level the impact of this global uh, power and the global law about protection of personal data, the right to dereference your name when you're not uh, when you're not okay to let your name in the old website. You have the right to send a letter to Google to say, please erase my name. So let's speak a little bit about global administrative law. What is it, global administrative law? Uh, the literature of uh, the, li the legal literature distinguish four dimensions of this global administrative law. Four kind of actors. So first of all is the action of the classical international organization. Second of all is the administration of the application of international agreements or operation of transnational networks. Example, Basel Committee and Banking Supervision. Third, national administration acting for the application of treaties, agreements or cooperation regimes. For administration by hybrid organisms, like this Internet Corporation for assign names and numbers. And five, the authors distinguish the administration by private institutions with uh, regulatory functions, like this anti-doping agency, or like this international standardization organization. Global administrative law is the system of regulation of the world inside these five kind of actors. So of course, where, are, where is the border and where is the territorial border inside this global administrative law? I think the border has disappeared uh, for a long time. Let's uh, uh, focus on the borders in our blockchain and I will ask you where could be the borders and the boundary lines <laughs> inside the blockchain system with uh, around the world. So what is it blockchain? The blockchain has an equivalent effect to the registration of securities in the account. It functions as a decentralized and secure register and make it possible not to resort to a depository, a third party certifier or, or a receiver. This register allows a traceability of the exchanges and operations carried out by all those who are connected or chained. It also makes it possible to execute transactions instantly thanks to the use of encryption keys. <coughs> this this uh, technology works for a lot of uh, operative things. They works for the money and the transfer, the money bank to bank. They, they works you know the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin is the name and behind this Bitcoin you have this technology of the blockchain. Uh, it works also for the insurance contracts, etc. etc. It's a it's a new branch of law and 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 a lot of different issues are coming. And we could we could uh, we could illustrate this uh, blockchain system with a legal illustration with the ordinance of the 8 December 2017 who devotes the blockchain technology to the French law under the exact title of shared electronic recording device. And of course, the border are completely 
virtual now, but it it means it's uh, borders. The effect of borders are not have not disappeared because the this technology is creating some effects like the transformation of legal relations with this concept of smart contract. The smart contract is a contract who is with the IA, with inter artificial intelligence, who is updating automatically by, by, by itself. Last, uh, last element of this uh, transformation of the postmodern border we could think of postmodern border as a liquid interface. It means the legal relations between legal orders and legal regimes. It means simply the question is how it works, the relation between the Lex Mercatoria with the national law, with the international public law, and with the European national law, the European uh, Union law. Because these relations between all these legal entities, systems, and legal orders are interpretable in terms of frontier. That is to say, in the sense of relations of legal differentiation. Borders are completely. Uh, it, it borders are becoming and became uh, legalized. Is not anymore territoriality. Is not anymore territory. Is not connected to a territory. Is uh, connected to a system of law and a system of regulation. And of course, you could be a part of the system if you have the power to have this technology, or you, you could be absent of this system of technology. That's a kind of a new <laughs> social borders. Uh, could be. Uh, could be. Could be challenging for the people. With this global norm, the question is the end of borders, the end of territorial border, or and also may and, and also the maybe the end of the legal border. Because if when you have only one global norm, and I will give an example how could you distinguish the national law when you have only one global norm who is applying and who is binding in each territory? You don't have any territorial borders. You don't have any legal borders. You just have a global norm who is, uh, who is uh, overlapping everywhere around the world with the states who have accepted this global norm. I will finish this presentation, I was too long, sorry, with this quotation of this sociologist, this Belgian sociologist, Guillaume de Grief, and he spoke about the functional border, and this quotation is quite incredible because it's, it's very uh, actual. The new social forms, especially economic ones, which are necessarily destined to transform the current territorial and sovereignty frontiers and proper ones into functional borders, that is to say in lines of penetration and activity in relations to their appropriate centers and with the activity of all other centers in the general structure. He wrote that, not last year, but he wrote that in 1908. So it's uh, the last thing I would like to share with you. And it's always important to go back in the past in order to understand better the reality and the future. Thank you for listening.